not in my best shape. <laughs> right, we're recording. <laughs> so yeah, the only, like my first question would be: you had like a look a little bit at democracy or no? And their concept. I told you right now before that they wanted to over come the nation state mm -hmm. through liquid democracy would it be your like kind of proposal for democracy earth mm -hmm. in respect to this argument sure uh, i think the democracy earth is the best use of the dot earth top level domain uh, for sure uh, <laughs> as far as i know it was the first one uh, and uh, the only one uh, for a very long time maybe until now i don't know <laughs> and so um because it's it's really uh, the one uh, unifying value of uh, people I don't know, as it's more and more participation and regardless of uh, whether you call it democracy or whether you call it citizen participation, it doesn't matter. People want to have more say uh, in, in the rules that govern their lives uh, and to scope it over Earth uh, inspires a sense of awe, of wonder. And we know uh, from psychology that once people have a sense of awe and wonder, they become more pro-social, they become more uh, selfless, they, they are more altruistic, more willing to form collaboration and so on. So I think uh, putting democracy and us together itself is a, a brand thing or a meme that will get people in a more collaborative mood. And I really think it's a good uh, use of the, the domain name. Um, now, I'm not uh, having the same feeling with the domain name Sovereign Software uh, <laughs> because it, it, it speaks to me uh, as a some way uh, to rebuild sovereignty uh, and to kind of a autonomous uh, ruling island, uh, this kind of metaphor is uh, stemming into my head. It's like you can have a lot of those islands running sovereign software and you know, all those little sovereigns, pockets of sovereigns uh, that somehow talk to each other or maybe not to, to talk to each other. But it is a, a much more, like the early internet, much more uh, fragmented, the powers on the leaf nodes and so on. But democracy as the, the brand to me is taking all these leaf nodes but then zoom out the camera and say, but we are on the same planet, at least until we live on Mars. So yeah, it is, It is. I think, the more unifying of the two frameworks. What we were really struggling um, in the beginning as well was a little bit defining the scope, no? Because we have now the liquid um, democracy concept mm -hmm. and the um, blockchain technology for that. Um, but we had, we had, there was like the pilot with the um, Colombian referendum. Yes. So when we're thinking, okay, we like came to the details now, okay, we have like our votes and we're going to delegate our votes mm -hmm. and we're going to write proposals and we're going to argue about proposals. Where should we put our scope? Like what should our fictive community or group look like? Should it be like a nation state? Mm -hmm. Should it be like policy, collaborative policy writing? Mm -hmm. Or should we look at like small organizations mm -hmm. like for the question of scalability? What would you like recommend to take as a starting point? All of it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, seriously, um, because the, the, the whole concept of uh, the meme uh, like this is that everybody should start with whatever she or he or, or they care about, right? Uh, and um, aside from this uh, willingness of awe and wonder and the possibility to connect, uh, I really think all these technologies you could just describe are, are excuses for people to meet each other to, to learn more about each other's lives and then to learn to trust each other enough so that they can take collaborative decisions. And of course the, the collective decisions, the technology we required, the process layer, will always change uh, in relation to the actual policy and power layer. In, in their actual context. So there is no one-size-fits-all technology uh, that not even paper, you know, is, is good enough for, for a lot of things. I mean, we use it for voting, for balloting, and so on, but it has also properties that precludes its use uh, for many things. And it's the same with blockchain. It's the same with any other technology. It has good uses. It has things that doesn't fit. So if we uh, lock ourselves to one particular process, not even technology, one particular process, then lose the of the unifying pop uh, of the like democracy us uh, those two together then it becomes you know a blockchain us or democracy blockchain or liquid yeah. us you know and, and, and all these things they, they use this catalyzing power uh, because then people would want to uh, actually expand their their uh, individual power 
because they have more of a stake in particular technology or particular process than people who didn't deploy these technology or their, this process. So really, I think it, it, it works best as a catalyst so that people can start with whatever they, they like or whatever they want, but somehow have a way to find each other. And I think this whole idea of storytelling, like the Democracy Arts team is working with, is a very good point because stories spread faster than software. Right? We know that as a fact. Nice. And um, like, how would you say are other values embedded in liquid democracy? For example, transparency. Like we have a very big problem that um, if you want to delegate your votes, mm -hmm. like uh, if you for that for that reason the outcome of the mm -hmm. vote the other person you delegate gave should be transparent to you. But this would be not in line with a lot of like. Democratic standards that every vote should be anonymous. Like, how would you kind of combine that, or would be a recommendation for that? Sure, uh, I, I see it as a, a, a way to signal right more bits to the decision making process. Uh, one's identity is a very strong signal, and it's also a signal that you cannot easily rebut. So we we are very careful in deploying that, of course. But if it's earlier in the decision making process, when people are just uh, um, having facts or sharing their own feelings, personal feelings, instead of imposing their ideas on everybody, then I find that people earlier in the process are more willing to be uh, identified uh, and to be non-anonymous. But the final uh, decision-making processes of ideas and the tally finding votes, and these, of course, because they have repercussions. People would think that if I voted this way and this decision is binding, then I will be rewarded or punished, no. uh, depending on who won the, the final voting. So the later the, the process is, the more likely that people want to uh, remain anonymous. No. Uh, that's the experimental fact. But also, I think liquid democracy, aside from being a voting method, it also um, compels us to think of policy not as a blind trust to another person, but as several layers of policy. And then, of course, then it's like a fractal. If you trust somebody on, for example, labor policy, labor policy is actually a, a, a weaving of many other policies. It's all interconnected. So I think uh, through liquid democracy, we get to see that all those different policy areas, how exactly they interconnect with each other, and then people have a much better idea of how the public policies interfere or uh, interrelate to each other than before. So just by the act of, it's just like participatory budgeting. Just by splitting the budget into finer details, people can agree on details much easier than the bulk. If you just have two choices or three choices, of course people divide into ideological camps. No voting method can, can solve this. Even you have like fully preferential, condorcet, whatever voting. If you only have two choices, people are going to be polarized. And so so it, the finer detail there is, uh, of course it will require more time to study and so on, but I think uh, in the long run it educates people to be more policy oriented and fact oriented. Uh, you have been talking about like the process, like when we come to the end of the process, how would for you the perfect deliberation and decision making process look like? like Information, mm -hmm. discussion. Right. Uh, what's your experience as well? Yes. Now, I think um, like. <laughs> I, I, yes. Uh, well, personally, I, I think if something is perfect, it stops being an excuse for people to improve it and uh, learn from each other. <laughs> uh, so, like this is the, the late singer Cohen who said, you know, there's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. Um, so. Uh, I actually um, sometimes consciously make typos in, in those collaborative documents just so that people will can fail uh, to, to fix them or that I post very naive ideas so that people would come to criticize and propose better ideas and I can thank them for it. And I think all this um, perfection does not exist in, in isolation. It's not a, a pocket thing. It only exists as a relation. And there is something that we call a very good relation, a perfect relation, if you will, uh, between people, and if they are in harmony, in attunement with each other, and so on. But perfection doesn't exist as an object in itself, or as a person in itself, or as a process in itself. It, we can say that, okay, everybody in the process is now completely attuned to each other's state of mind, and so on. But in that moment, it passes. It, it doesn't last, no. right? So, so for us, uh, why uh, I introduced so many like recording, VR, everything like this, is to capture some of the phenomena 
of uh, reaching empathy, of reaching this kind of human. It, it can't capture more than maybe 10% of it, but at least when you revisit, there is a, a starting point, a baseline for people to resume from that empathy, from that attunement. And, and it always degrades with time. It, it's never perfect, but then everything alive is like that. <laughs> and when you said before, um, like giving more defined um, options, like a more mm. variety of more mm. defined options yeah. instead of like binary logic, mm. um, should they be like the mixture between bottom up and top down? Mm -hmm. How would you deal with that? Like, would you actually? Right. Uh, there's the diverging phase, right? Through open questionnaires, through a lot of survey methods, we can collect more uh, ideas and feelings of a lot more people. And now that we actually have the technology to take all those raw materials and make some sense out of it so that it can converge. Yeah. But the convergence doesn't happen automatically. It doesn't happen automatically. <laughs> Always people who, who actually understand the, the problem construction, the problemization, the, the public service context uh, must evaluate the feasibility both in the local culture context and also it's not against the law of physics <laughs> or anything like that. So it takes effort to converge which is why I think, uh, aside from the translation that reaches many stakeholders as possible, the immediate next bit is facilitation that tries to get people reaching toward things that they can live with. And, and this is the part that so far uh, have escaped automation. I, I, I still look forward, of course, for a day where we can have AIs uh, doing facilitation. But so far, we can only augment facilitators to make them uh, much more easy to, to reach more people, to be more attuned, like when people raise their hands up, uh, automatically zoom and give that person the microphone instead <coughs> of passing the microphone and things like that. So uh, machines can help the facilitation process, but the facilitation um, state of mind at the moment is still a, a human thing. Uh, and so I think it's instead of saying uh, top down or button up, it is a for me a constantly diverging and converging and diverging a little bit more so that people can select among the possible opinions but then it's more constrained the problem solving space now has excluded things that are obviously impossible physically so it's diverge more converge and then diverge and finally we converge to a point where everybody can live with it and then we can determine a policy nice <laughs> thank you all right thank you <laughs> it was short <laughs>